and welcome to our Cambridge Creative Encounters Showcase. We are so delighted to be able to share films, animation and writing produced through collaborations between researchers at the University of Cambridge and creative professionals from Cambridge and beyond. These creative adventures, combining the skills of researchers and artists, bring our research to life. We hope they also provide opportunities to start conversations, those where each of us can share our own expertise, where we can ask questions and also question what we see. And it is these conversations that are so important. They open up new avenues of inquiry and can improve research, its relevance and its impact. So please explore, question, share your thoughts and ideas with us. We took actual footage from your research, you know, taken through like microscopes and things, and then almost like dramatizing them with kind of mark making and color and animation to bring out the, this, the inherent beauty in chemistry in the first place. Shift might be 16 seconds, but in real time it has taken us more than 16 hours of discussion, which I enjoyed very much. So I think what we've produced is something that I could use both in an academic setting to explain my research, but also in a kind of public engagement setting as well for different age groups. So much out of it just in terms of my own research. Hopefully the beauty of this video is that you can come at it from any level of engagement and learn something. really done anything like this before and I was just completely blown out of the water with the end result. Doing a PhD can be really really hard and actually it's quite difficult sometimes to feel like you've got something beautiful at the end of it but this genuinely has been one of my favorite things in the PhD. We're ready. Yes. Hi, I'm Stanley Georgieva and I am a PhD student or a brain scientist in the making. Hello, I'm Andres Canales Johnson and I'm a brain scientist. So we've always been fascinated by world-class musicians and their ability to perform with flawless technical precision, but also to improvise in the heat of the moment, creating beautiful music all along. So we decided to set up an experiment with Pedro Stach, a renowned flutist from the world of Hans Zimmer, in order to answer this one very simple question of what happens in the brain differently when these creative modern day geniuses like Pedro are playing from memory versus when they're improvising. So we choose Pedro Eustach because he has a very strong intuition about his experience as a musician. He has felt during his entire career that there are two completely different musical processes going on in his mind. One happening during the experience of playing something by heart and another one totally different when he's improvising music. So we met with Pedro in November 2019 on the only night actually that he had off in a matter of weeks touring with the world of Hans Zimmer. And he invited us to his hotel room and generously basically shared his entire evening with us, performing for the experiment and telling us stories from his life and basically from his lifelong relationship with music. And the experience was just beyond words. So we set up an experiment in his room. Um, it's an EEG experiment. EEG is a device that allows us to measure brain waves, and it's composed of many different sensors that sit on the head. 
and each sensor can actually capture the simultaneous activity of millions of neurons at the precision of like one millisecond. Basically, that's 1,000 times every second. So in the experiment, we tested better during three different states of mind. The first one was resting, which is the baseline, where he literally just relaxed. The second one was playing music that he knows by heart, like those in his famous music soundtracks. And the third one was improvising music, where he created from scratch a solo out of three randomly selected notes. The idea was to compare the different brain patterns that are specifically associated with these two main states, playing music from memory and improvising. And we can only hope for the future that we can get more musicians like Pedro at his level to take part in this experiment and help us answer this question. I realized through the years that maybe there's a little bit of Asperger in me. You can see the obsessiveness and these yeah. things. It's like I cannot take no for an answer. I went to my dentist and I had it open. This yeah. is something I spent 10 years of my life developing. Right. One thing is the experience acoustically here yeah. with, my, with my actual ears. A completely different thing is to be on a stage, on a microphone, in no time to warm up. Pick up, they put this huge close up and light. And go. Play. Yeah. 12,000 people listening to you. <laughs> Once you gave me the three notes, I can at will put myself in a state of mind, state of soul. That, okay, Lord, do your thing. What, ah, then I can hear. And I think every improviser does that. Yeah. God has allowed me the blessing and has put in my heart the way to develop a sensitivity to do that. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Jesus freak. I literally feel that the Holy Spirit takes me and guides me. That's what I feel. I learned, I opened up to something that I believe potentially was there, mm -hmm. but I had not access to that before. And that came when analyzing Mozart. Once you know the foundations of music, what music is made of. Yeah. It's like cooking, you know how to cook. You know exactly, because I've worked so hard yeah, on my cooking fun. skills, okay. not just playing. Yeah, way deeper than that yeah. is to know the mechanics that yeah. make music happen there's inhaling there's exhaling there's the heart if you flatline you're dead anything that for me is alive has to go and come back and that's an absolutely most fundamental law upon which the musical phenomenology dynamic is based upon here we go where are you going? very very masterful experience that you've built up so that it that allows you to step out of the way so to speak because you're like automated all of this so you don't have to be actively there you can step out of the way what is the, the role of the rest of us the role of music defined by the greatest musician of all history of humanity without any doubt Johann Sebastian Bach he said that music exists to glorify God and to sublimate the human soul. That for me is the cross. It's a vertical reality and there's a horizontal reality of people witnessing my going vertical. It bless me to feel your reaction to what was happening. And if you do not respond like that, that might influence me. Mm -hmm. Not in a good way. Because that would make me doubt. Of course. I can experience this and I do all by myself and it's a wonderful thing and I just go vertical and then the resonance is with myself. I guess you're making decisions while you're improvising. Yep. Yep. It's not like the kind of decision that you make when you play 
a piece that you know by heart? Absolutely not. Yeah, and what's the qualitative difference between the two? That one is a path that is established yeah. and I need to recreate the perfection of my finger position and my breathing and my coordinated articulated thing from my tongue to get this result. I already know what's going to happen. I just have to recreate that if I put the ingredients back in order. When I do something new, I don't know what I'm going to do. When I picked up the duduk before and that face came, I was like, whoa. Yeah. You open your, your soul and your mind and your heart to be able to hear. Mm -hmm. And that is what yeah. is from a completely different place than when you play something that is established. Yeah. I wish someday we can do a thing in which you can literally map 3D the brain and you can see the colors and things, procedures uh, going, going, coming, yeah. because well, I will guarantee you that we will see that when I do something creative, it's completely well, different, well, pros, yeah. completely different than when I'm very specific playing something. Yeah. We can actually do that with this. I'm sure we're going to prove what I feel because I remember when I couldn't do that and I felt one part of my thinking was adormecido yeah, yeah, yeah. Sleepy. was sleepy yeah. is a place of trust a place of experience a place of you have worked so much is more than knowledge yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's an ingrained thing that is i can trust yeah. myself out of the way it that takes a lot of faith yeah. because we're control freaks this demands exactly the opposite to let go Correct. London, 1854. Physician John Snow discovers that cholera is waterborne and traces the outbreak to a single contaminated water pump. By removing the handle, he stops the spread. Since then, many diseases have been linked to contaminated water. Research and technology have enabled testing for presence of E. coli and other potentially harmful microbes. However, access to safe drinking water remains a global challenge. More than 800 million people do not have access to safe drinking water, and 2 billion people use a contaminated drinking water source. Dirty water kills over half a million people every year, more than from HIV and malaria combined. To solve the problem, we need to identify unsafe water sources. Water testing in low-income countries is slow, expensive and complicated. It often involves visiting local villages, taking samples, then transporting and testing in faraway laboratories. Waterscope is developing simple, low-cost, microscope-based water testing systems that can identify harmful bacteria in just a few hours. This enables testing by local people in remote locations at the source of the problem, empowering communities to tackle the spread of infections. The Waterscope system contains the collection kit, the incubator and the imaging system. The collection kit and the electric pump are used to collect and pass water through a cartridge that contains a microbe trapping filter. The filter is then moved into the incubation position and growth medium is added into the back chamber. The cartridge is incubated for several hours using a power bank inside the case. Once ready, the cartridge is transferred to the imaging system and analysed using a machine learning algorithm. The results can be read either using the screen or the Waterscope app. The data can be mapped in real time and shared with local governments and NGOs to introduce interventions with the goal of worldwide eradication of waterborne diseases.
My name is Julia Hayes and I was very fortunate to win the competition to have somebody illustrate my PhD research. I ended up working with Sorrel Mill who made a beautiful film I research which we've called Thrive. My PhD research has looked at the education of children with disabilities in the rural hills of Colombia. There they use an innovative and successful model called Escuela Nueva, but nobody knows how that addresses the needs of children with disabilities. So that was my work out when I spent nine months in Colombia. What was fantastic about this is that having the animation has enabled me to be able to show the children a video, a product that just reflects the beauty of where they live and the story that we told together when we were working there, um, do participatory research. So I would say that doing a PhD can be really, really hard and actually it's quite difficult sometimes to feel like you've got something beautiful at the end of it. But this genuinely has been one of my favourite things in the PhD. Uh, having a product that I can show to children and teachers that reflects their journey in something that's accessible for all. Um, it's just one of the best things that's happened in my PhD and I want to thank you very much for this opportunity. In the mountains of Colombia, you will find us, teaching in our Escuela Nueva School. In this little class, we have everyone, all ages, all grades, all abilities. Each child is beautifully different. Some are studious, some lively, some speak only with their eyes. For those with disabilities, we are there to encourage, letting them work at their own pace. Activities are creative, by teaching children to help each other, together we are a team. But it doesn't always work as I'd hoped. Sometimes I feel overwhelmed. However, with the support of families and practical teacher training that helps me facilitate and manage, we are all able to thrive. Our school and community can work as one. We can raise our children together. Hello, my name is Ruth Jackson Ravenscroft and I'm a research fellow in theology and philosophy of religion at Sydney Sussex College in the University of Cambridge. My research and writing has focused a great deal on the 19th century, how religion and theology were perceived in 19th century thought, culture, politics and society. Last year, I published a book called The Veiled God, which was about the theology of a German thinker, Friedrich Schleiermacher. But the research project that's been featured in a beautiful film by Rita Hakkarainen for our collaboration as part of the Creative Encounters Initiative at Cambridge is a project about the Annunciation in modern art and culture. The Annunciation is that event depicted in the Christian Bible in the Gospel of Luke where the Virgin Mary is told by the angel Gabriel that she will bear a son and that that son will be the son of God. The Annunciation was such a popular topic for artists in the Renaissance and medieval periods of the Christian West. But in our film, we ask, how on earth do you go about depicting an event like that in the art and literature of today? In modern paintings, Gone are the halos that you'd associate with the frescoes of medieval Italy. And instead, we find much more of a focus on the humanity, the body of Mary. The Annunciation evokes a series of really fascinating questions. Not only religious questions about the nature of truth, the possibility of the miraculous, and the reality of a creator God, but also questions important to contemporary society too, around gender roles, the way that women's bodies are perceived and valued, and even the issue of consent within relationships. Rita and I hope that you find our film enjoyable and also thought-provoking. The 
the Annunciation. In the Gospel, according to St. Luke, the angel Gabriel delivers news to Mary, a young woman from Nazareth, that although a virgin, she will conceive and bear a holy child, the Son of God. This scene, so beloved as a subject for artists in the Renaissance and Baroque periods of the Christian West, is no less astonishing, unsettling, or ineffable to readers and viewers today, believer and non-believer alike. For, depicted here, is a meeting between finite and infinite, human and divine. And as a result of this encounter, Mary, the clear human focus of this scene, will have all of her worldly relationships shattered and rewritten. Theologians will tell you that she has been chosen, set apart. Something has happened to her that others will not understand. But today, given that we enjoy no clear, shared conviction about the reality of the transcendent, given we place a high value on personal freedom and choice, and given we are becoming increasingly aware of the construction and deconstruction of gender roles in our communities, the Annunciation narrative, with its unexpected pregnancy, generates an even more expanded series of questions and suspicions. What is the relationship between faith and obedience? Or between love and suffering? What kind of choice did Mary have? Hello, uh, I hope you enjoyed our Cambridge short. Uh, we now have the chance to hear from our researcher, Dr. Ruth Jackson Ravenscroft, and our creative, Rita Hakarainen, that collaborated in, in this project. Hi, both. Uh, Rita, I will start with you, if that's okay. Um, I'm quite curious to, uh, to know, what did you need to know from Ruth to start this project? What were your tools to interpret, to interpret Ruth's research? Well, uh, she um, she sent me first her her brief, uh, the text uh, um, of her research, uh, on which she applied for the uh, Creative Cambridge Creatives, which was really interesting. It had some artworks and uh, plays, theatre plays, and philosophy in there about uh, Annunciation, Mary's uh, when Gabriel comes to tell Mary that she's going to have a son of God. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and then she had um, lots of questions in there, there about uh, uh, did Mary actually have a choice or, or not. And um, so it was quite an in interesting paper and I, I researched as well a lot of things, but um, it, uh, the film was only two minutes. And then it, um, they said, uh, he said as well, that uh, we can't have even the credits over the two minutes. So I realized we have to condense this into two minutes. And I asked uh, Ruth, please uh, make a text, which is exactly one minute, 45 seconds. <laughs> um, so that was the, the main thing, which we, we had to con first concentrate on that. And then she did, did a great text. And um, then I started working on a storyboard and uh, the general concept, uh, which I, I decided to concentrate more on the art history side, uh, because it's visual, <laughs> of course, and I did an animation. So, um, yeah, so we, then we had a lot of discussion about paintings, which I'm going to include and not include, and uh, what can, can we do with with that and play around, around um, with uh, yeah change of how Mary changes through the time, mm -hmm. um, from you know having on one side the angel, on another side uh, Mary, to not depicting 
a um, Gabriel at all, or having him as a light or flower or just a, a call on a mobile phone or mm. text. So, um, and then, yeah, so that we had a lot of discussion, like a kind of about this. Brilliant, thank you. And and now to you, um, Ruth, what, if you can tell me a bit what were your expectations at the beginning? Did you already know roughly what was the level that you wanted to pitch the, this film and, and how this process of these discussions that Rita here explains so well? So it's it's actually difficult for me to remember what I, you know, before when I was applying for the project, what my initial ideas were, because things have changed so much, because actually this is so collaborative. Obviously, Rita produced the film herself. So all of the creative wonder that you see, all of the images, the drawings are all of hers. But when it comes to the ideas, we spent so much time discussing with each other, both via email and on FaceTime together, what the film was actually going to look like. and. As Rita says, you know, we were sending each other paintings that we were going off and we were researching paintings, both ancient and modern, of how Mary has been depicted um, in this this event, you know, and in the Bible where, you know, uh, Luke talks about what happens to Mary uh, when she's told by Gabriel that she will give birth to the son, a son and the son will be the son of God. It's a couple of lines in the text. But the really wonderful thing is, is that, you know, throughout history, this is, and, and Rita described this yesterday when we had a chat, it's like a blossoming, a, a flowering of, of images that throughout history of these, you know, these couple of lines of text have generated so many artistic reproductions. So the two of us spent ages. Um, so, you know, things like El Greco, Caravaggio, Henry Asawatana, and in terms of pitching pitching the, the video and you say, what level did you want it to be pitched at? The really wonderful thing about all of this and, and all, of all, all of our conversations that went into the video is that when you watch it, if you're an art historian, you can come to this video and you will probably recognize most or not, if not all of the paintings that Rita has been inspired by. So there's that really kind of, if you're coming at this from a very expert level, yeah. you know, you'll immediately be saying, how how has Mary been? Oh, that's a Caravaggio um, inspiration sort of that slide. And there's this moment where Rita depicts the the news hitting Mary um, via you know Mary gets a text from Gabriel. So it's a very modern image of how this might happen if we were going to depict it today. But um, she's done it in a way that Mary, when she receives the texts, briefly switches into a, a posture like that of Eve in the Garden of Eden. And this is something, you know, putting Eve and Mary together is 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 is, 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 is a motif that's existed in Annunciation painting since the Renaissance, since the medieval period. So um, if you were a theologian, you would know that when you watch the video and you would say, oh gosh, you know, I can see that happening. So if you're coming at this from an expert level, you can still get something from the mm -hmm. film. Whereas if you're coming to this film with no knowledge whatsoever of Christianity, because of the strong visual element, there's still so much you can gain from it. And Rita's listed at the end of the film, all of the paintings that she used as, as inspiration. So we're hoping that some of the questions we ask in the script, um, like, um, questions around gender roles, the way that women mm -hmm. are perceived, women's bodies are perceived and valued and how that's changed the way that the Annunciation has been depicted through time. People m could engage with that question and have a think about it. Um, similarly, you know, they'll come to this and they'll say, oh, I really enjoyed that image of, of, of Mary and that final painting, that final scene, where's that from? Let me go and have a look. Um, so I think this, that you know, hopefully the beauty of this video is that you can come at it from any level of engagement and learn something and engage with it. Brilliant, thank you. I think now we, like I, need to go back and watch it again. And I think we all of us do, because now I think it brought uh, new ideas. Well, thank you both so much. It was a pleasure collaborating with you in this work. And um, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Emily Sanford. Uh, I'm an astronomer and I worked with Dr. Alina Loth, who's an immensely talented artist and animator on an animated short film for Cambridge Creative Encounters. 
This film was about a project that I worked on with another astronomer, uh, Zephyr Pinoyer, uh, about a near future science fiction concept called the Lunar Space Elevator. So imagine you have the Earth and you have the Moon. <laughs> They're about a quarter of a million miles apart. Um, and Earth is much more massive than the Moon is. Um, so if you're very, very close to the Moon's surface, just because of gravity, you're going to fall back onto the Moon. Uh, but if you're close to Earth, you're going to fall onto Earth because of gravity, once again. Um, there is a point about five-sixths of the way to the Moon um, where the gravity of the Moon and of the Earth balance exactly. So if you were there, you wouldn't move in, in either direction. Uh, so imagine hanging out at that point of balance, and imagine you have a long, long cable. Uh, and now imagine paying out one end of the cable towards the moon and the other end of the cable towards the Earth in such a way that you maintain this gravitational balance. So you always have this sort of same weight towards the moon side as you have towards the Earth side as you pay this cable out. Um, eventually, the moon side of the cable is going to hit the moon. It's going to touch down, and you can anchor it there. And the other side will just be dangling some distance above Earth's surface. Um, and so this configuration of this cable uh, is called the Lunar Space Elevator. Uh, the reason that you might desire to build such a thing uh, is because once it's in place, you can use it sort of like an elevator cable to crawl your way along uh, to travel between Earth and the Moon uh, more efficiently than you otherwise might. So. Usually when you're in space, the only way to move around is to sort of propel rocket fuel out in the opposite direction of where you want to go, and then conservation of momentum will take you where you want to go. Um, but this is pretty inefficient because it means that all of your orbital maneuvers, everything you plan to do in your space flight, you have to bring enough rocket fuel to do that with you off of Earth's surface in the first place. Um, and that's a very uh, expensive proposition. <laughs> so whatever you can do to minimize fuel costs is really good. Um, and so that's the, the lunar space elevator. Um, the reason that Zephyr and I wrote this paper and sort of explored this concept in the first place um, is because uh, cable technology and material science have advanced to the point that this is no longer a distant future science fiction proposition. This is something that might conceivably be built in the next 20 years, <laughs> relatively cheaply. Um, and especially in this age now where we have sort of individual billionaires who are making decisions about what things get built in space without much democratic input. Um, I think it's really important that all of us start to imagine and envision these things um, and start deciding what we collectively want to happen uh, on this new frontier of space. Um, and so that was the sort of the goal that I came into uh, this Creative Encounters project with. Um, and Alina does such such beautiful illustrations of the natural world that it, it really, it was a natural match. Um, we wanted to design a sort of aesthetic for the video that it was not the sort of traditional hard science fiction visual language that you see. Um, in concepts like this. We wanted it to appeal to, uh, to people who might not otherwise spend a lot of time thinking about humanity's spacefaring future. Um, and I hope you enjoy the results. Thanks. Shut up, Shut up and sit, and sit down. down.
My name is Surabhi Agrawal and I'm a PhD student with Professor Stuart Clark at the Department of Chemistry at the University of Cambridge. I applied to the Creative Encounters project with an interest in creating an outreach video for my research work with a slightly different approach. Instead of presenting the solutions to a problem, the idea was to explain how uh, one may approach a problem scientifically. So answering the why what and how of a scientific query. When looking at corrosion, why is it important to study it? What is it? And how do we go about doing the research? For instance, I use three very different techniques which use light, x-rays and electrons to image the process and more. All of these give complementary information which improves our understanding of corrosion. The video goes into more details of what these techniques are and how we use them. The initial idea was actually to create a dance video, but when I was paired up with the visual communication creator, the video changed into an animation video. Ali has done such excellent work with it that I'm really happy with the final version and I hope you enjoy it as well. Corrosion is a natural process that causes metals to deteriorate gradually over time. Exposure to air and water causes metals like steel to corrode, presenting a big issue for the vehicles, vessels and structures we rely on in our daily lives. By recreating simpler conditions in a lab, chemists can study steel corrosion using a range of experiments on a sample in situ. We can observe the chemical reaction that causes corrosion by adding fluorescent dyes that glow under a confocal laser microscope, allowing us to collect data at thousand of a millimeter and build a better picture of what happens when steel corrodes. Using an X-ray microscope, we can get even closer to analyze how corrosion forms. By measuring which energies our sample absorbs, we can work out the elemental composition of the buildup. And by examining how X-rays diffract, identify its material qualities from its atomic structure. And with an electron microscope, we can observe how steel corrodes at the atomic level to determine where it forms and how it grows. By studying steel corrosion, we can learn what it's made of where it occurs and why it forms, so that ultimately we may develop ways to safely lessen its impact. Hello, I uh, hope you have enjoyed our Cambridge short. We now have the chance to hear from our researcher, Surabi Agrawal, and our creative, Ali Asaf, that collaborated on this project. Hi both. Ali, I'll start with you. Hello. Uh, Ali, I'll start with you. Uh, what did you need to know from Surabi to start this project? What were the tools that you used to interpret her work? How was this collaboration? How, how did it happen? Yeah, well, this was a really interesting collaboration for me because, you know, so so what I do as a visual explainer is I help people share knowledge and tell stories and explain big ideas, but I've never yet done something that had to condense like years of chemistry PhD research 
into 90 seconds of an animated film that you could show anybody without any kind of grounding or background in the subjects and be able to understand and appreciate just just you know how amazing this research is and, and, and the impact that it, that it can have. Um, so Sarabi and I, we kind of started by having so many conversations. We did talk an awful lot about, and, and Sarabi, you were so patient in explaining to me all, all the minutiae of your research. And I think from my perspective, it was a really interesting challenge to kind of choose, well, which are the most crucial bits that need to be there? And what's the most kind of top level approach we can take to it, whilst also infusing the visuals with something that feels correct. And actually, we did a lot of work, Sarabi, didn't we, where we took actual footage from your research, you know, taken through like microscopes and things, and then almost like dramatizing them with kind of mark making and color and animation to bring out the this, the inherent beauty in chemistry in the first place. I mean, I think when you showed me those X-ray diffraction things, the little starbursts, I was just like, whoa, how cool is that? Um, but yeah, I just, I, I really loved working on it. And I think for me, just kind of having that chance to tackle something so complicated from my perspective and to have someone so lovely and patient to work with me and to collaborate with me to make it, I just loved it. What an experience. Uh, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Now, Sarabi, I'll come to you now. And, and for you, what were your expectations at the beginning of all of this? You already had an idea about the, uh, at the level you want to pitch this short, while, while the idea is you had at the beginning for this short. And did that change after? Just talk a bit about that, if that's okay. Um, so I think I started, like I got involved in this initiative uh, mainly because it was, I thought it would be an interesting idea to, you know, uh, create some outreach for the PhD work I'm doing because I enjoy what I'm doing and I want other people to talk and you know listen to it and realize how cool it is and um, so I just uh, so I've seen a lot of like I've come across other videos which have done really well but usually in science videos when you go for outreach it's about you know uh, this is what the problem scientists had this is how they solved it and now this is the solution and I thought it may be an interesting perspective to rather than talk about we have come up with a solution to actually talk about how science actually approaches any problem. So that was the idea we had behind the video that we're going to show how do like, you know, scientists actually break down a problem. What's the problem solving skills we uh, take part in, like, you know, engage in. And like my PhD is on corrosion, which is like an age old problem. It's older than chemistry itself, but it has a new, like the work that I'm doing is just basically using a new approach to it. And that was interesting. And um, so basically that was what I was went in with, you know, it'll be interesting to do it. And I didn't uh, expect to collaborate with an animator, but it was just such an enjoyable experience just talking to Ali and, you know, talking about what I'm doing. And it, it's just, uh, you sort of start living in your own bubble when you're talking, like, you know, when you're doing a PhD, you talk to your group mates or you talk to anybody when you're talking, like you go in depth of what you're doing in your PhD, it, you start talking to, you kind of limit yourself to people from the science background. Like I talk it to my friend, like my friends and my family, but after a point they just start nodding your head, like they're nodding their head along and they don't really care. But like, you know, here Ali had to get it because he had to, you know, <laughs> animate it. So he had to get it. So it was just so much fun, you know, talking to somebody who had a completely di different background and, you know, just making him see, oh, this is really cool. I think it's cool. Do you think it's cool? <laughs> and, you know, just uh, visualizing it. And yeah, the, uh, yeah just it was just um, like Ali was saying, like, you know, the data, I think I had forgotten how vibrant the data we were collecting was. And he made me appreciate it more. So that was something that I really enjoyed being part of this, that I, I, I think I got a deeper appreciation of the work itself. Brilliant. Well, thank you both so much. I think now uh, everyone should go back and watch the short again because after this conversation, you will you will feel you will you'll see it in in another light. So thank you both so much for giving for giving a bit of your time and thank you. It was a pleasure to collaborate in this project. I hope you have enjoyed Cambridge um, Creative Encounter Shorts. We will continue to take questions over Twitter. We hope you can join us tomorrow for Creative Encounters Very Shorts at 1 p.m. You can register over the festival website. Okay, thank you. Bye.